Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today we're asking whether more information is always better. And to spoil that question, the answer is yes, at least in a decision-theoretic context. Remember, in game theory, we have multiple agents playing an interaction where their payoffs are strategically interdependent. So what I do affects my payoff and your payoff, and what you do affects your payoff and my payoff. Decision theory is different. Decision theory only involves a single actor taking an action or multiple actions that leads to payoffs, either for that individual or for that individual and others. The bottom line here is that's only a single person involved in the decision making. The reason that when there's just a single person involved in decision making, that more information is always better for that individual is because that individual can always ignore the information that he or she receives. So if for some strange reason, acting on the information that was given to you would hurt your payoff, you would simply ignore it. So one way to think about this theorem is that it is the Willie hears ya, Willie don't care theorem. Again, if you get a piece of information when you're playing a game by yourself, you can always ignore that information if it were to harm you. This is not going to carry over into the game theoretical context. When we have multiple agents playing a game, we're going to see that, in fact, more information can harm the individual that has that information. And to see this, let's think about the following game. We're going to start with less information. We're going to see what the payoffs can be for this game. And then we're going to see what's going to happen when we give a player more information. So let's start with a situation where there's less information available to a player. We have player one choosing whether to play or not, a simple binary decision. If he doesn't play, if he quits, then everyone gets a flat payoff of one. Simultaneously, player two has three actions to choose from. She can pick heads, she can pick tails, or she can pass. If player one didn't quit and player two passed, both players receive a payoff of two. If player one didn't quit and player two chooses heads or tails, then we flip a coin. And if player two called it correctly, then she'll receive three and player one will receive negative three. And if she's wrong, then player one will receive three and she'll receive negative three. So you should notice that if we have a situation where they actually play the game and player one chooses, or rather player two chooses heads or tails, that the expected value for both players under those circumstances is zero because half of the time the individual is going to win and half of the time the individual is going to lose. So three and negative three averages out to a flat zero. So this game looks like this, where we, again, if player one quits, flat one for everyone. If player one plays and player two passes, both players receive a payoff of two. And because we worked out the expected value for play and heads as well as play and tails, zero is across the board there. We can solve this game with Nash equilibrium because no player has any sort of informational knowledge that the other player doesn't have because that coin is flipped afterwards so no one knows what's going on there. And one thing you can note is that there is an efficient Nash equilibrium. If player one plays and player two passes, both players receive their highest possible payoff. So that's a Nash equilibrium. There are other equilibria here. You can check that on your own if you want to pause the video now to do that, you may. But that's not the important piece of information. The important piece of information here is that when no one is informed about the coin flip, we get a payoff of two for both players. So this is what we want to compare the next situation to. And the next situation is going to bestow one of these players more information. In fact, we're going to give player two knowledge of the coin flip. So rather than player two not knowing what the coin flip is going to be when she chooses heads or tails, she'll see the result of the coin flip privately. So she knows this information and player one doesn't know this information. So this is information that's private to player two. The payoffs work exactly alike as before. It's just now that player two is essentially cheating and she knows what the answer is to that coin flip. 
Now we switch over into a world of Beja Nash equilibrium because we have two different types of player two. We have a heads type, which is occurring with probability one half, where that coin has been revealed to be heads. And so she knows that if she chooses heads after player one plays, that she gets a payoff of three, whereas if she were to choose tails, she would receive a payoff of negative three. And there's another type of player two, of course, the tails type. And this is just flip-flopping those payoffs from the play heads and the play tails outcomes. The question we need to ask now is whether player one can choose play with positive probability. And the reason we're asking this question is because if it's not possible for player one to choose play with positive probability, that means he's quitting with certainty. And if he's quitting with certainty, then both players receive a payoff of one which would mean that player two is harmed by the information that she is given. She gets more information, she has an informational advantage, and yet somehow, some way, instead of receiving a payoff of two, she drops down to a payoff of one. And we're going to see that the answer to this question is no. Player one cannot choose play with positive probability, so player two will in fact be harmed by the information that she has received. So let's think about why it cannot be the case for player one to choose play with positive probability. Imagine that player one were to do that. What's player two's best response? Well, obviously, if player one is playing some of the time, player two should be choosing the correct side of the coin. And she knows what the answer is, of course, because she's been given that information ahead of time. Now, there's a slight trip up here because this is ruling out any sort of positive probability of choosing play at all. But the reason that this logic works, even though player one might be quitting some of the time, is because if we look back at the payoff matrix, this is again for the tails type, but it doesn't matter whether it's the heads, ta heads type or the tails type. If player one quits, player two gets a payoff of one guaranteed. So it doesn't matter what strategy she uses under those circumstances, which means if player one is playing play with positive probability, then her best response is going to be whatever is the best response to play, regardless of how small of a chance that it is that player one is choosing play. So we know that player two has to choose the correct side of the coin if player one is going to choose play with positive probability. But now let's think about whether player one would actually want to play play with positive probability under those circumstances. Well, if he's choosing play with positive probability, then he's receiving a negative three that portion of the time, and he'll receive a payoff of one from quitting at the remainder of the time. But this means that some portion of the time he's getting a very bad payoff. He's getting that negative three because player two knows what side of the coin to call because she has seen the result of the coin flip. Well, that means he could profitably deviate by choosing to quit. If he chooses to quit, he gets a payoff of one guaranteed, and that's going to be better than a combination of negative three and one. So it can't be the case that player one chooses play with positive probability. There are no Bayesian Nash equilibria in which that occurs, because we have shown that there's a profitable deviation under those circumstances. So we have shown exactly what strategy player one must choose in any Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this game. He must choose quit. Now, what player two does, you could figure that out on your own if you really wanted to. You could look back, pause the video, and figure that out if you'd like. But it doesn't matter for the purposes of answering our original question of whether more information is always better. We can stop here and conclude that more information is not always better because we know what player two's payoff is for this game. It's a payoff of one. So without knowledge of the coin flip, player two receives a payoff of two, and with knowledge of the coin flip, she receives a payoff of one. Her payoff has diminished. Let's think about why this is the case to conclude here. We have improved player two's knowledge, but the issue is that player two now faces a credible commitment problem. She can't credibly commit not to act on the information given to her. That is, to play heads when the coin says heads, or play tails when the coin says tails. And so as a result, she cannot credibly commit to play pass. And it's only under the circumstances where she's playing pass 
would player one be willing to choose play instead of quit? So they can reach that payoff of two for both players rather than the payoff of one. So while player two is enriched with more information, it's triggering a commitment problem, and we know that commitment problems can lead to bad outcomes for players, and that's exactly what's going on here. So more information isn't always bad. In fact, if you take a random game, it's a very good chance that more information will help out whoever is receiving that information. But in the context of this one particular game, it is not better, which means that we can't have any sort of broad generalizations about whether information is good or not for players. We have to look at it from game to game. All right, that wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you next time. Take care.